the incredulous Stuart was not convinced, and when the hand was finished, he said eagerly, You have a strange way, Ralph, of proving that the world has grown smaller. So, because you can go round it in three months? In eighty days, interrupted Phileas Fogg. That is true, gentlemen, added John Sullivan. Only eighty days. Now that the section between Rothal and Ahalabad on the Great Indian Peninsula Railway has been opened. Yes, in eighty days, exclaimed Stuart. But that doesn't take into account bad weather, contrary winds, shipwrecks, railway accidents, and so on. All included, returned Phileas Fogg. We'll make it then. The journey round the world in 80 days? Yes. I should like nothing better. When? At once. Only I warn you that I shall do it all at your expense. An excerpt from Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Hey everyone, welcome back to Booking It. I'm, of course, your eloquent host, Cooper Cobbs, and joining me today is my very good friend, Mr. Tanner Lewis. How are you doing today, Tanner? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Well, we are here back on our first episode of the summer reading kind of thing that we're doing, and uh, we're talking about Around the World in 80 Days by Mr. Jules Verne. And uh, for those of you who don't know, our summer episodes are typically pretty chill, pretty laid back. We just talk about the book in question, and we're going to have a lot of fun while doing it, uh, because that's what we do. Uh, real fast, before we get started, though, I do need to um, let you guys know that some we're going to make some big changes to the podcast moving forward in regards to the format and how we do things. So when, when I started kind of way back when, when the podcast was just beginning, thinking about how the podcast would look and how the format would play out, I took a lot of things um, from another podcast, and the format was very heavily inspired by this other podcast. And recently, that podcast reached out and asked us to change the way we do things moving forward because they felt like that was theirs. And so out of respect for them, we are going to be changing the way we do the podcast moving forward. It's not going to be that big, but we're going to have a lot of fun new segments. We're going to mix up some things, and we'll walk you through them today as we go forward. So it's going to be a lot of fun, and uh, we're going to look forward to those cool changes that we're making. So um, I guess first off, Tanner, you have some author bio. You're going to be talking about Mr. Jules Verne, the famous author. I do. So Jules Verne was uh, one of the most influential authors of all time and uh, was born on February 8th in 1828 in uh, Nantes, France. Um, Despite his father's... So so he's French. He's not not British. That is correct, ironically. uh, Are are his parents British, or is he just raised there, or is he actually French? You know, I couldn't tell you. All I know is that he was born in France. (laughs) Okay, excellent. So this is my very deep dive into who Jules Verne is, if you get what I mean. Anyways, his dad wanted him to pursue a legal career, and uh, like all good children, he said no. And uh, um, uh, quickly started um, uh, immersing himself in his passion for writing. Mm-hmm. And so um, uh, Verne wrote books such as 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Journey to the Center of the Earth, and uh, this book, Around the World in 80 Days. And these books quickly became renowned for their imaginative concepts and their captivating adventures. He blended scientific knowledge with gripping narratives, pushing the boundaries of possibility, and earning him the title of the father of science fiction. Anyways, that's a little short on Jules Verne. Where he died is unimportant, you know. (laughs) So, so how old was he when he was writing all these things, though? So you said he was born in, the, in 1828, but, like, this book was written um, in the 70s, right? 1870s? Yeah, so he would have been around 40, 45. Okay, yeah. Middle-aged. Middle-aged man. It's cool. Well, I think that um, a lot. I've read a lot of his books, the junior <laughs> versions of his books, if that makes sense. Like, I, I, I have vivid memories of reading Around the World in 80 Days, journey to the center of the earth and Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea i've read all of them in the junior versions probably multiple times um so that's something that i know he's written a lot of famous books and i don't think i've read the real versions of them um ever until i recently just read the real version for around the world in 80 days so that is kind of interesting and it's fun to kind of um come back to him and the real books so what about you tanner like when was the first time you experienced jules verne or how did you kind of get into him Ooh. Um, uh, I think that the first time that I actually picked up Jules Verne was probably uh, two years ago, year and a mm-hmm. half ago, somewhere between that. I couldn't tell you why I picked it up. Um, uh, it's possible that it was on our bookshelf, possibly. Yeah. I honestly couldn't tell you. 
Um, uh, somehow I yeah, he's, he's he's one of those names that I feel like I've. I've grown up with for sure, just like a, a name that's just an author, and I can't remember a time when I first heard about it. Yeah, I feel like that's just like the same for me. Like, I don't really have a definite memory of like the first time that I started reading his stuff. I think mm -hmm. that um, uh, I definitely know that I read Around the World in 80 Days. Um, uh, that was the first time reading it, and that that was definitely two years ago. Yeah, but what's funny is I think that we are planning on doing it for um, a bonus episode behind uh, over on Patreon, we, right? And you would you we read were, it, right? And I was the only one that read it. Yeah, that was well. That was one of the times where I feel like um, we had trouble scheduling, and then summer happened. Yeah, and so we just did, did something else for bonus episodes as we got to the fall of that next year. So yeah, yeah. Anyways, I read that, and then uh, um. Uh, I think that I picked up I picked up Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, probably once, in mm -hmm. between the past sometime within the past two years, and I started reading it, but I could not tell you anything that happens in that book. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, I mean I I've seen I've seen they put the you know the old Disney movie uh, on Disney Plus, and so I think my sisters and I watched that a couple years ago, and it's pretty good actually. And I think they – I can't remember if it was filmed in color or not, but they, the edition they have is in color. Um, but it's pretty – I mean, it's it's one of those old Disney movies that's live action, and it's just spectacular because they put all the money and all the all the work into it. So it's a lot of fun. Um, and actually, for some reason, we saw a, like a early 2000s version of Around the World in 80 Days that was like very satirical and not at all like a, a faithful tonal adaptation, if that makes sense, to the book. But it was just a funny comedy that loosely followed the plot of the book. So, anyway, those are some some movies that I've seen of his books. But let's move into now the segment that we like to call the book in thirty seconds. That's right, we're bringing it back, guys. We're bringing it back. So, Tanner, why don't you give us? Yes, why don't you give us the book in thirty seconds for Around the World in eighty days? Okay, you got the timer ready. I got the timer ready. Three, two, one, go. A man who is very, very scheduled all of a sudden finds himself uh, in a bet to go around the world in 80 days. He proceeds to do this plan. A jewel robbery happens, and uh, now there has been a robbery. He's the suspected robber. All of a sudden, he's back at home, and he's been arrested, and he doesn't win the bet, if I remember correctly. Except, except he does win the bet, Tanner. Except he does. But nobody thought okay, that he so actually here's the, should. Okay, wait. Okay, hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, here's, okay, here's the deal. So, so Tanner uh, it has read again. He read the book a couple years ago, and he was in the process of rereading it when it became necessary to record. Because if you haven't noticed, Isaiah's already gone. Tanner will be gone soon. So anyway, the end of the book, Tanner. If you recall, and as I was reading the book, everything started coming back to me. If that makes sense. Yeah, for like, sure. Like everybody knows the classic plot. He's got to make it around the world in eighty days. And then I completely forgot for some reason. That you know he's been he's been charged with this robbery and there's that whole subplot and that happened I was like oh yeah that's a thing and then uh, Passporto keeps making a big big hay about his watch right and how he's gonna keep it on English time right oh yeah and I remember that's stirred in my memory oh yes that's right when they get back it's gonna be like oh he gets arrested oh he's not gonna make it in time they're gonna get married and then Passporto was like yo you actually we gained a day because we crossed the meridian. And so they win the bet. So that, that was kind of uh, another part of my, I guess, you know, history and first experience with the book was, yeah, I, everything started coming back to me. Such a classic plot. And I remembered everything about it, but it just came, kind of got revealed as we went along. So, yeah. Yes. All right. Let's move into the segment we like to call thesis statement. This is where we're going to make our thesis statement concerning our thoughts about this book. So I guess I can just go first. Here's my thesis statement about, about this book. This book is a well-written kids' book. It has a classic, solid plot, but I don't think there's a lot to return to if you're an adult or you're an older teenager. Okay, um, so let me explain that a little bit. It's obviously it's just it's a it's a classic at this point. No one's refuting that, and there's a good reason that it is a classic. It's got a fun plot. It's well written. It's engaging. However, it's very plot oriented, and although it was a lot of fun to come back to it this time, and I don't think I've like I said I don't think I've ever read the real version. I'm not sure that I'll come back to it. 
you know, every year. <laughs> I might, you know, introduce it to my kids or I might come back to it 10 years down the road. But I don't think this is a book that has like a lot of meat that you can just go back to over and over and over again um, and enjoy it every single time. I think that it loses a lot of its luster um, after the first time you've read it. But that's my, that's my thesis statement. So Tanner, what about you? What is your thesis statement? And then we can kind of go back and forth and discuss them. Okay. I think that it's that around the w- world in 80 days is good literature. And I think that mm-hmm. it's very refreshing. Like I, I enjoy the fact that it's like lighthearted. It doesn't, it's got enough to keep you intri- intrigued, but it's not going to like overbear on you. Um, uh, right. I think uh, that it just lacks a little bit of like carry to the story, right? Like all of a sudden you're just back if you get what I mean. And uh, like the progression of the story is, uh, uh, this is where my word trails. This is where my thought process trails off. Um, <laughs> like just, uh, the way that the story is, it feels uh, way too segmented in my mind. It's, ep- it, it is episodic. Yeah. It's episodic. Yeah. Anyways, my thesis statement, I did I, not enjoy that. <laughs> I would, I would, um, I would say that it is episodic, but I don't think that's a flaw, okay? So maybe you felt like it was choppy or whatever, but I think that's just a fun. I think that's I think that it's a perfect part of the book. Like this is a book where you're going to go to India, you're going to go to China, you're going to go to Japan, you're going to the US. You're going to go to all these different places and you're going to get an episode where you're just living in that culture for a while. So I think that the plot kind of necessi- necessitates it, and I think that it's a, a good part of the book that is something that is built in and is a good part of the book. So I, I will defend the episodic nature of it. I think it's a perfect feature. Maybe it's just the fact that I only got through like three episodes. So there's that. That's true. <laughs> yeah. You haven't, you haven't even gotten back yet. I, I And I will say, like, if I can just say, well, we'll talk about it later too, but I think that all the episodes are really fun. And especially if you haven't read it before, they're all really tense if you don't know he's going to make it back, right? And also the book kind of fakes you out at the end. And it's like he didn't make it back. So it makes all those seem rewarded. Um, all right, well, let's move on to the next segment. That is prose chops. So, Tanner, how do you feel about the writing in this book? How do you feel like Mr. Mr. Jules Verne's prose was? I feel that it was very... It wasn't complex. It, it wasn't mm-hmm. like I was going to go read A Tale of Two Cities and, uh, like, be borne down upon by the full weight of the English language. Um, uh, right, but also it's it's. I mean, it is more sophistic- sophisticated than the modern day is. It definitely right? is. Mean, it's, it's a it's a Brit writing in the Victorian era, basically. It definitely is. Maybe it's influenced by the fact that I was reading the Theogony three days ago. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'll that, that, could, that could be it. <laughs> that could that could definitely make make a little bit of natural English speaking flow very nicely to the ears. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that overall it's very good. Um, uh, I just like the way that um, uh, like each sentence is like short, nice. I don't know. Just reading it, I just enjoyed the way that his sentence structure and the way that he organized his paragraphs. Yeah. And actually, one thing that uh, appeared to me um, while reading it, it just kind of hit me, uh, and is a big thought that I had kind of throughout the whole book, was how much I love – in a in a good kid story, the third person omniscient narrator. Yes, <clears throat> a lot of a lot of things today, and it maybe maybe it's not okay. Let me let me offer up two things. Number one, I think it was really refreshing, like you said earlier, to come to this book because I've been reading so many point of view novels, right? Uh, and so, yeah. if, if someone's not aware, let me back up here. There are two ways of telling a story in the third person. So the third person is basically just yeah, third person pronouns. So it's he said, she said, they did this, they did that, right? It's not I did this, I said this. That's a first-person narrated story. So in, in the third person, there are two different ways to do it. You have the third-person omniscient narrator, and you have the third-person point-of-view narrator. Now, the point-of-view narrator is very similar to the first person, except that it's in third-person pronouns. So whenever, whenever, you, whenever you're in a third-person point-of-view narrated story— you're getting only the character whose point of view it is, only their thoughts, only their perceptions. So you can't jump around like you would be able to in a third-person omniscient into other people's heads. You're only experiencing the world through this one person. Now, obviously, there can be a lot of point of views in one novel, but it's just a point-of-view-oriented narrator. 
And so that is very common in modern day, and it's also very common as you get, as you get older, I guess, um, as you get into more of the teen fiction and young adult as well. And so I don't know if it's overall point of view is just taking over from Omniscient, which I think it is, but I think that kids' books lend themselves much more towards the third-person Omniscient. Like The Hobbit um, is especially a third-person Omniscient story, and I really like it because it's just a grandfather telling his kid's story, right? And so he is the he's the narrator. Bilbo is not narrating in the third person, or somebody else is not narrating from their point of view. It's Tolkien's point of view of the story. And so that can be a lot of fun. And reading around the world in 80 days and coming back to a third person omniscient after having spent so much time at point of view was really fun and refreshing. And um, kind of the irony, the subtle irony that he's able to employ as well in certain scenarios in which we know things that the characters don't um, is a lot of fun. So I, I really enjoyed the third person sense of his, of his style. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I enjoy the omniscient er- narrator so much. I think that when done well, it is one of the best. One of the best yeah, I point, agree. point of views. Like, very, very well done. Yeah, when you nail it, I mean, it really is just, you know, fireside storytelling, which is awesome. So, all right, let's move on to our next segment, character formation. So, we have really four main characters, I guess, in the story. You have Phileas Fogg, the guy who's undertaking this journey, his trusty servant, Passporto, um, and his future wife, Aouda, and the inspector who's trying to arrest him the entire time, uh, Inspector Fix. So how do you feel about the characters? Uh, do, you, do you develop them well? Are they just, like, you know, are they three-dimensional? Or are they more, are, you know, character types or just two-dimensional characters? How do you feel about the character development in this book? Um, uh, I couldn't, s- I can't say much about Aouda, um, just because I haven't, I didn't spend much time with her this time around, but, mm-hmm. um, uh, just remembering back to Fick, like, my original thoughts of what, of Detective Fix, Fogg, uh, and Passporto. Passporto is just an amazing character, just yeah. straight off the bat. Like, his character arc is beautiful, succinct, right. it's amazing. I enjoy Fogg's yeah. um, uh, character arc as well. You know, it's very it's a very linear linear character arc. Um, yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> there's definitely one there, and he, it's very intriguing to watch. Yeah, he. Rem- I mean, all the characters remain pretty steady in terms of their development. Like, I don't think that Fogg or Passporto undergo any major changes necessarily. Yeah, but I think that the real development happens in terms of like the affection between the characters, right? So you're sure. going to watch Fogg and Aota's, um relationship grow to where they're going to get married at the end, right? And you're going to watch Passporto and Fogg's relationship grow to where it was just business and professional before mm-hmm. to actually a a, um, a a bond between two people that like each other and are fr- deep friends. So I think that, yeah, the characters are great, and the, the change in, is in the way they interact with each other and in their affections for one another, not necessarily in the way that their character necessarily changes. If that makes sense. Indeed. Um so as far as, like, the, the characters go, I mean, Fogg is your typical stoic, like you said in the very beginning, very ordered. Um, he likes his schedule. Um, and so he's the natural protagonist for the story. Like, he's a perfect protagonist. And you, you, what you said earlier kind of made me think of uh, Sam and Frodo and Lord of the Rings, right? Passporto is the fun character who ends up being the real hero of the story, and it's kind of the fan favorite, right? And then you have the straight man, Fogg, um, who is like Frodo, who is the guy who needs to, you know, complete the journey and lead the journey but also um, isn't as interesting or isn't as fun, I mean, as maybe some of the side characters are. But I think that characters are all fun, and even though they're not, like, fully three-dimensional necessarily, who cares? It's a kid's story, and they're interesting, fun characters that fit the story. So um, that's my perspective on those. Indeed. Okay, so uh, next segment, we have Bird's Eye View. So world building, um, how do you feel about I know the world building here is more like how did he, how do you feel like he captured all the cultures that we went to, right? I think that how he did about... pretty well. Um, yeah. uh, I think my mm-hmm. most vivid memory has always been the India scene, that India segment, right. just like the way that he uh, portrays their um, their culture is just so. Right. I don't know. It makes you feel like you're there. It it really does. It's um, it's very well built. It makes you feel like he's been there too. It does. It does. It it definitely has the idea of like, oh my gosh, this guy's been there. Or like, it definitely, it gives off that vibe. 
and uh, I definitely enjoy the way that he interacts with the with the scenery <laughs> if you get what I mean yeah like the way that the story like it always seems to very be very centered around the culture in each episode mm-hmm. anyways yeah I agree yeah I think it got a, a good taste and a good flavor of all the cultures and some of my favorite things were just like uh, when they were in Utah. I mean, he's giving you like a whole expose on the history of Mormonism and their beliefs and like that. You're like, wow, I didn't think when I picked up this kid's book, I'd le- be learning about the Mormons. But here I am. Um, so that was funny. And, you know, obviously the jokes about polygamy are in good taste. And I like those. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> as one does, as one does. But yeah, like I said, the India segment is obviously very vibrant and fun. And honestly, and I think that this is something that we're less sensitive to maybe than other people are. But I don't think that he's that racist. I mean, I think that this book for being written when it was and when England was still, you know, owning India and colonizing it, I feel like he, that he gave it a fair shake, you know? He definitely uh, and, did. In America as well, with the uh, westward expansion, I think that he was fair in terms of saying, yeah, the, the Indians attacked trains sometimes, and it was pretty bad. And, you know, there are people in the Indian wilderness who would sacrifice virgins, and that was pretty bad. But also, you know, the Brits aren't all that good in terms of their, you know, invading India and things like that. And there's obviously issues with religion and with visitors and tours and things like that. And also in America, you know, I mean, there's some serious strife and division going on here as well. So I think that it aged pretty well. I don't think it's going to get canceled anytime soon. Um, But uh, I don't know. Maybe somebody will think that. But I think he did a pretty good job of capturing capturing the cultures. Um, So thumbs up. Indeed. Um, Anything else to say there or move on? Yeah, I, I definitely enjoy all of the cultures. That's about all I have to yeah. say. It's, 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 I mean, as a kid, like I said, what you're going to walk away with is, wow, it was a fun taste of so many different cultures that, you know, different um, and in the same book going really fast. And so it's a lot of fun to um, hit those cultures and learn about them and ha- each have their own distinct flavor as you're going on. So, all right. Well, next segment, thematic turbulence. Tanner, how do you feel about the themes in this book? What did Mr. Vern want us to walk away with and did he succeed and is that a good thing that we should walk away with Ooh. um uh, what did he want us to walk away with it's gonna be hard because i didn't finish the book um uh, yeah not <laughs> i mean in not any book though like the themes have been set up yeah you know at the beginning of the book so very true um i think uh, that like just uh, the idea of uh, um uh, I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm just letting my mouth talk now. I don't know. Ah, classic Tanner on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't like it's, it's a, it's a fun kids adventure book. Like, it's not deep. Or exactly. Like that's that, why it's, you know? that's why it's tough. I mean, yeah. When I was thinking about like what to say here. I just, like, I pull little things. Like, there is a, in this universe, in this world, there is a sense of, there's a sense of moral rightness, right? Like, the people in India who are going to sacrifice Aouda, they're wrong, right? And you can feel, you know, fog and Paspartou and the author's indignation against that, right? So there is a standard here of right and wrong, right? So there, that is there, uh, which is, again, refreshing. Um, and also, <laughs> I mean... This is something that was interesting, and I want to get your thoughts on it. The main character is basically a stoic. I don't know if <laughs> he thought that, like, you know, throughout the whole book, Passporto was, you know, like, stamping his foot and, like, we're not going to get there on time. And Passport- and Mr. Fogg is like, it's okay. You know, we'll get there on time. Stay calm. So was it, is the book advocating for, like, Mr. Fogg over Passporto? Um, is it advocating for a kind of stoicism or not? Like, what do, how do you think about what do you think about that? You know... I think that um, uh, I don't think it was advocating for stoicism. I think that it was uh, um, uh, more more so advocating for a cool head. I think that like I don't know. I think that like a lot of times we'll blow up over things when they don't go our way, uh-huh. and uh, when right. the train all of a sudden doesn't go all the way across India, or we uh-huh. are late for the steamer. I think that right. we have a tendency to blow our heads and uh, stomp off. Well, yeah, scream and also at our we don't have siblings. thousands of pounds that we can just hand to somebody and get our way, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cooper. I'm trying to take this very to a very moral <laughs> high road over here, and he's just like, just be rich. 
<laughs> I mean, what I'm trying to say is like, yeah, you're right. Like that, that's true. But also, this dude just had a lot of money, and so he could afford to be calm. You know, <laughs> fair, Cooper. Wow, appreciate that. No, no, I'm just, I'm just making. It. I'm just, I'm just observing things here. Okay, <laughs> that is true. Maybe that's my first, yeah, but my first world America speaking. No, I mean, I think, I think me. you're right. I think you're right. I think you're right. I don't think I don't think that it's trying to cancel out the personality of Passporto because obviously he's a very fun character. But I think what it is trying to say is you're right. Listen, don't freak out over this one little thing. Life is so much bigger. Get a get a big picture of things instead of just freaking out, right? But at the same time, you know, it, it's it's showing you that Passporto was a fun character who has his own personality and that's fine. He just shouldn't, you know, like you said, blow up about the little things. And I will say that concerning Mr. Fogg and him being a quote-unquote stoic, I mean, I think that there is real growth in his relationship with Iota, whoever flimsy it might seem, is pretty real, and it, it works for me at least. Like, I mean, yeah, he's kind of a... He doesn't show love like a lot of other people might, but he is um, going to provide for Iota, he's going to protect her, um, and he's going to go after her... Um, when you know and he and Pesperto are going to go save her so like there is real love here even though it might seem like he's being emotionless if that makes sense so i think that the book was clearly saying that there are many good things about mr fogg and Pesperto, but ultimately mr fogg is able to have better self-composure in certain cases so that's where i stand on that yeah i agree i think that yeah i agree with all you said <laughs> yep all right well let's Come into the final segment of our thoughts, which is the final edit. So, would you change anything about this book, and what are your final thoughts? You know, I don't think that I would change anything about this book. Um, uh, yeah. I think that overall, the story, the plot, the writing style, I think that it all hit very close to home. And uh, as I said, a breath of fresh air from Theogony and... Hesiod. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think I would change anything at all as well. Like I said, it's the classic plot. Everything works. Um, and even though I might complain, like I said earlier, about there not being like all that much to return to, you know, it's still it's still a well told story. Um, and so who cares? It's great for kids, and it's well 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 made and well told. So I am hundred percent fine with leaving this thing as is. So I agree with you on there. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for listening to our thoughts. Let's move into some donor shout-outs. So, Tanner, what would someone do if they wanted a donor shout-out? They would go to patreon.com forward slash booking it and subscribe to any of our $5 and up tiers. That's right. And so we are working on something new and something fun to do with our donor shout-outs, and that will likely feature next episode. But until then, we're just going to shout you guys out real normally. All right, Tanner? So I'll say their name, and you're going to shout them out. So we have Nana. Nana, thank you. Vampappy and Wayla. Grandpappy and Wayla. We have Mike and Sylvia as his grandparents. Thank you, guys. Mike and Laura as his parents. Thank you. Anna. Go, Anna. Emily. Thank you, Emily. Becky. Thanks, Becky. Lizzie. Thank you, Lizzie. And Keenan. Thanks, man. All right. we. I think we have a lot of – what I want to do at least with donor shoutouts is going to be a lot of fun. And so I hope we can make it happen for the next episode because it's gonna be it's gonna be so good. It's gonna be it's very gonna be so exciting, good. folks. And look forward to it. Yeah, and Isaiah is getting dragged into doing it too. Um, he's hesitant, but it's okay because he's gonna like it a lot. So, all right. Well, hope you enjoyed that episode of the new format, which we'll be refining and working on and making a lot of fun for you guys. And uh, we'll be back next time, sometime in July, with an episode on Persuasion by Jane Austen, which I have started. And I'm a couple of chapters in now, so it's getting good. Just got good. So I'm excited to talk about that with Tanner. And uh, Isaiah's never read a Jane Austen book besides for school, um, so I don't know if if he's going to appear on that one, but we'll do our best to, to make him appear. So thanks for listening. Leave us a five-star rating and review. Support us if you can. We'll see you next time. Until then, keep on booking it.